I would like to teach you the recipe for making chev. Chev, I can't really say it, I don't speak French. Chev, some people say chevre. However you say it, it's fine. But what you're making, as you probably know, is fresh goat cheese. It's that creamy, chalky, brittle, crumbly, beautiful stuff that you stuff into dates or crumble on top of your salad. It's one of my favorite cheeses, and I learned how to make it when I was working on a goat farm in Midcoast, Maine called Appleton Creamery. We had fresh, beautiful goat's milk. We did the tiniest bit of tinkering to it and turned it into piles and piles of fresh, beautiful chev. And I ate it morning, noon, and night. So good. Now I live in the city. I'm across the entire country from that goat herd, and I don't have a goat in my backyard. But I still know, I still figured out how to make fresh chev because it is so pleasant to make it. It's also really pleasant to eat it, having it, it just made. It's extra aromatic. I'm going to teach you a way to make it that is as easy as possible because I really think that the fewer obstacles that one has in their path into home cheese making, the more likely they're going to keep going. So I'm presenting you with another can't lose recipe that is going to be so minimal in terms of how much work and cleanup that you're going to have no excuse to not make it. So how do I do it? First, I start with goat milk. Here's a quart of goat milk. The one most important thing about using store-bought goat milk such as this is that you want to make sure you find something that only says pasteurized. It's okay if you can find raw goat milk for sale in the store, which you can here in California, but in most states in the US, you actually can't buy raw goat milk. You have to have your own goat. So of store-bought goat milk, the thing you have to look for is that it says only pasteurized. Can't be the ultra pasteurized, which is a little bit more common. Um, so this may mean that in your area, you might not have the right milk to make shove, which means get a goat. Okay, take my quart of milk and warm it up to room temperature. Room temperature being about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. The way that I get it warm, I could always pour it into a pot on the stove, stir it and gently warm it up, but I do the, the lazy method of just put it in a pot of water um, as you're washing dishes, leave it in the sink, um, leave it on the counter for an hour, half an hour, let it just warm up to 70, 72 degrees, not hard. Um, then I open it up. <clears throat> Be sure that if you are leaving it in the sink as a way to warm it up in your warm in your in a bath of warm dishwater, make sure it's truly closed. You don't obviously want those two to mix. So opening it up, I'm gonna go ahead and check the temperature with my true thermometer to make sure we're really at room temperature. You know, you don't even really need a thermometer if you um, have a sense of temperature. I can feel this and feel that it feels just a tad, the tiniest bit cooler than the room. 72, 73, it said 73. All right, now my next step is to add cultures. To make a fresh chev, a chev that I'm gonna eat within the week or within two weeks, I only need one type of culture, the primary culture. And that primary culture can either be cultured buttermilk or my um, more specialized laboratory produced freeze dried cultures. I'll go get them from the freezer. Okay, here is my example of my freeze dried culture. I use it all the time so you can see I've already worn down the bag a bit. This one is called Floridanica. And um, I could use this. I could use a culture called MM100. Also, on some cheese supply, in some cheese supply companies, they sell special mixes that are called that are especially for chev. You don't even have to do any of the thinking. Just know there are a couple of different culture options: one in liquid form, many in freeze-dried form. I can add one or the other. I don't really need to add both. Um, so if I'm adding the freeze-dried. I would add to a quart, which is the tiniest bit of milk. I would add a very little bit, like a, in, in close to a skewer tip. That's, that is um, probably an eighth of a teaspoon to a sixteenth of a teaspoon worth of cultures. I just sprinkle those across the surface. 
and then wait. Remember the cultures that come from the freezer, I don't want moisture to get in there, so I quickly close the bag, tighten it, I might duct tape it in place, back in the freezer. Okay, if I was gonna add the buttermilk, I'll just mimic what I would do. I would add roughly, where are those teaspoons? Who knows? I would add roughly a um, teaspoon to two teaspoons of buttermilk directly into the, into the pint, into the quart. And if you're using buttermilk, just a reminder, needs to be cultured buttermilk, can't be vinegar and milk mixed together. Okay, my room temperature quart of goat milk has now been inoculated with the primary cultures and I'm letting the freeze-dried ones just soften a little bit at the surface of the milk. Now, here's something that's really interesting. This recipe is really wonderful because I can make it into a fresh cheese, a cheese I'm gonna eat in a few days. I can also do a little tiny extra step and I can make it into a cheese which ages between two and four weeks and turns into something pungent and complex and fudgy and mold covered and delicious. Um, think of a uh, French, small French form, French, small format French mold covered slightly aged goat cheeses. I'll go get an example from the fridge. Okay, one option, fresh goat cheese. Another option, mold ripened aged goat cheese and basically the same recipe. So by mold ripened, this would, be, this would be probably my best example. These are all at different phases of development and slightly different shapes because of the different cheese forms or molds that I've used. What I mean when I say two different versions of goat cheese, I'm saying fresh, which is the fresh chev that you buy in the vacuum sealed log, or mold ripened, in which case a rind starts to form here are two, three examples of a, of a rinded, ripened cheese. So this one, can you see that wrinkly pattern? That brain-like pattern? That's the effect, and you could actually also see it on this one, it's just, an, it's just a little bit smaller, but there's sort of like a wrinkly, brainy-like thing. Can you see that? And it's even on this one, except these ones are just Pretty brand new, but if you could zoom in so close, I can see it. This wrinkly, brainy, moldy, fuzzy, velvety kind of texture growing in. And more than seeing it, I can smell it. If you like more robust cheeses, go this direction because mm, it just smells pungent and yummy and kind of, well, I wish I had more adjectives. It smells really good to me. I'm gonna put this back in the fridge while I finish off my recipe. But the point is, fresh chev or mold ripened, same recipe. If I wanna make fresh chev, all I do is add that Floridanica MM100 or buttermilk, base culture, stop right there. If I want a moldy rind to form, especially that brainy patterned one, I can add a skewer tip of this secondary culture, which I call, which is called Geotrichum candidum. It's commonly used as a mold covering in ripened goat cheeses, ripened meaning aged. So I'm gonna go ahead and just add a skewer tip so you can see what I mean. Can you smell that smell? It's on my hands. Okay, that's my skewer tip, the tiniest amount. Same thing. Tapping it over the surface. You could actually probably add half of that. Just as a reminder, this is a very small scale that we're working at. This is home scale. So sometimes when we add things like cultures or rennet, we're actually probably over adding because it's too hard to get and to measure the actual, the accurate amount for such a small quantity of milk. I'm gonna put this right back in the freezer. I've added my primary cultures. I, for this batch, added my secondary cultures. That's the Geotrichum candidum, which is either a yeast or a fungus. That's gonna create the moldy rind on my 
more ripened version of Chev. I want to go ahead and gently mix in those cultures, gently. And now I'm going to go ahead and add one half a drop. It's a little silly to do a half drop. Um, and I'll show you how I do a half drop. Here comes a little bit of um, a half drop of calcium chloride. So this is how I do a half drop. I take one drop and put it in a spoon, then get rid of this. And then I take roughly a, a larger amount, we'll do a half teaspoon, we'll do a quarter teaspoon, and add that to the spoon, mix it up, and then I'm going to take half the amount and add an eighth of a teaspoon of calcium chloride. No, no, not an eighth of a teaspoon. The volume was an eighth of a teaspoon. The amount was a half of a drop. Here's the take home idea. A tiny amount. An easier way to do that would also be to double your recipe. Have two quarts and put them together in one pot, then add one drop. I'm just showing you the, the, the mini Cooper version of home um, chef making. Let me put that there. Okay. Just going to reiterate, warmed goat milk, primary cultures went in, that was Floridanica or buttermilk or MM100, those are my freeze dried ones. Then I decided I would make this my more fancy chev, put a, just a skewer tip of Geotrichum candidum into the milk, let everything hydrate, and then gently mixed it in. Then I added a half drop of calcium chloride, and now I want to do the same thing with the rennet. I want to um, do a half drop of rennet. This is the more important, if you added a full drop of calcium chloride, no biggie. But if you over add the rennet, it will make your chev not velvety and smooth, but tough and rubbery. So be careful, pay attention. I would guess, I think I need to say that a medicine dropper is kind of essential at this point. If you can figure out how to get a single drop another way, go ahead. But medicine dropper, it makes it easy. So here's my one drop. I'm going to drop that one drop into the water. Get, put this one aside. Put the rest aside. And so here's my one drop mixed in with, expanded with a little bit of water. And then I'm going to add half the volume of water to my milk. Quickly close it, gently stir in. So warm goat milk, primary cultures, secondary cultures, half drop of calcium chloride, half drop of rennet. And now my favorite step of cheese making, leave the darn thing on the counter for 12 to 24 hours. 12 to 24 hours later, I'm going to go back and check on that goat milk that I left on the counter, see if it's changed. Definitely different. So right away through the container, I can see that there's sort of a yellowish liquid and chunks of curd floating around inside. Also, I can see it at the bottom. It's subtle, but it's there. Here's another thing I'm going to check on, if the smell has changed. Oh man, goaty and good. Definitely, this is fermented. It's just what I wanted. So here we go with the world's easiest way to make fresh chev at home. All I have to do is now empty the curds and whey somewhat gently into something where it can drain. Here I have a plastic draining basket, a little piece of cheesecloth. Before I do that, I'm just going to go ahead and rinse the cheesecloth. I like to do that. 
I like to boil my cheesecloth every now and then just to make sure that there's less lint. But here, I'm wetting it also so that it forms a better, serves as a better wick as it draws moisture out of the curd, away from the curd, separating the cheese from the byproduct. Okay, here we go. It's my funny home cheese making design, so know that commercially it wouldn't be quite this funny. But I've got to get the curds and whey out of the bottle. And I want to go somewhat slowly. Pause and put this, pull this back up. Can you see what it looks like? Maybe you should have used a bigger piece of cheesecloth. Remember the mold spores for the geotrichum are in here as well as the primary cultures. Okay, empty bottle, draining curds and whey. I'm gonna go set this up over the sink so that it can drain freely. In this bowl, it's quickly sitting in, its, in a little bath of whey, which I don't want. I wanna have this drain freely. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna bring the edges of the cheesecloth together. This is my favorite way to drain chev. Using a rubber band or tying the ends into knots, I'm gonna form a little curd pouch. Check this out. Cool. And if I want, I could hang it over the neck of the sink, the, the faucet. If I don't wanna occupy the sink while it drains, I could figure out something where I take a spoon and suspend this over a bucket, like a bowl. How about this? Right? Cool. I'm very excited because cheese makes me excited. This cheese, it's not really cheese, it's like in between beginning cheese and finished cheese. It needs to drain for a minimum of about four hours. Probably you don't want to let it sit for longer than 12 hours. So I'm going to give it about um, eight hours and I'm going to check back in with it. It's going to become dry, cheese-like, and it's going to stop draining as it is now. All the whey or the watery byproduct will have left the curd. Then we'll have chev that we mix up with salt. So let's check back in in a couple of hours. By the way, when it drains, it's okay to drain it at room temperature. In fact, the room temperature versus fridge temperature encourages a more rapid draining. The only thing to pay attention to or look out for is you don't want debris or cats or dogs getting into your draining cheese project. So I would say take a lid or a cap of some sort, cover it up so that it doesn't get disturbed while it drains. We're returning now to the drain chev, which we had a few hours ago put into this cheesecloth and it looked so abundant when we shook it into the cheesecloth and now it looks amazingly little. That's because the yield on cheese is quite small. You get about 10% of the volume of the milk um, out of the milk as cheese. So good to know. It also is advice to you as a cheesemaker to try and make a larger batch. We only made one quart of goat's milk worth, and this is how much one quart of goat's milk turns into as fresh chev. Very nicely dried, I mean drained. Some of those bits stick to the cloth, don't worry about it. If you want a, a moisture chev, drain it for less time. If you want a drier chev, drain it for more time. Okay, so that's my one quart of milk turned into chev. The thing about it though is it's still unsalted, so my goal now is to add the salt. I like to add just a small amount of salt initially and then taste it and see if I'm going in the right direction. This mixing also homogenizes the curd a little bit. It's really dry on the outer edge of the bag and kind of wet on the inside of that, of that hanging bag. So as I mix it, it makes it a little bit smoother. Okay, 
just take a taste and see if there's enough salt in there. Put just a little bit more, but it tastes great. Okay, this chev is done and delicious. I would serve this with roasted beets, sprinkle it over a salad, use it even in place of cream cheese in a cheesecake. Whatever you wanna do with the chev, it's up to you. But I wanna give you one idea of how to serve it that's a little bit fun and fancy. What you need to do is take a plate and use your clean fingertips to form the chev into either a log or a patty shape. I'll do a log. That's really, really common for chev. Next, figure out some dried herbs or spices that you like. I like to use dried basil. I like to use herbes de Provence. Sometimes I use dried dill. It's really up to you. Shake those spices onto the plate. And then just ever so gently roll your fresh chev through those spices. There you have a herbed, go a herbed fresh chev log. Here's another savory way you could serve your chev. Form the chev into a log. Then shake hot chili flakes onto the plate. Don't go too crazy because you want people to still eat the cheese. There you go. So one way you can drain the chev is into the cheesecloth and the colander. But another way you could drain the chef, if you wanted to have a round cheese shape, is you could drain it directly into the cheese form, like this. Make sure the cheese form is small enough. What I do is just hold it over a bowl and right on into the cheese form. And when this drains, it's going to shrink down and become its own little cheese puck. If you drained your chev into a little cheese form or basket and formed a little cheese puck, and if you added that geotrichum, you can do something really special that is common with these aged um, small format goat cheese, goat cheeses. You can dust it with ash. This is vegetable ash. And to dust it, it's as simple as that. I keep, I keep this ash in a salt and, sh a salt and pepper shaker. And when the cheese is not too old, like two to three days old, once it's come out of its container and I've added some salt, I go ahead and I cover it with ash, and this ash is mainly aesthetic, but the mold spores that I added to the milk will grow through the ash a little bit and give it a beautiful shimmery gray appearance. If I find that 
35 minutes have passed and I've only gone up three degrees, turn the heat higher. So you just have to figure out what works for you and your stove.